Hello and welcome to the 12th edition. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 12th edition of Bol Global. Sexualized violence as a weapon in the Ukraine and Tigray. How can we more effectively fight these war crimes? I'm very pleased to welcome you. Some more viewers are going to join us over time, but uh, we're going to start now. I'm Lela Zubaidi. I head the International Department in Heinrich Böll Foundation as a backup. We have translation into German and English, so please use this little globe in the lower bar in order to select the respective channel. With a little globe sign at the bottom. Und wir werden diese Veranstaltung aufzeichnen. Darauf möchte ich Sie We're going to record this meeting. And later on, we will post that online. Also, we have two live streams in German and English. In the past decades, women and human rights organizations champion for sexualized violence and conflicts are no longer uh, being reduced to the sexual desires of mostly male soldiers or is dismissed as byproduct as of brutal war acts anyway. Today, for many war situations, it has been documented that sexualized violence often serves in, as an instrument to, um, in, to demoralize the declared enemy as an instrument to enforce power, to mark conquer territory, and also to express hatred. In the majority, women are affected, but this form of violence can also be aimed at men. With this discussion, we want to focus primarily on two current wars in Ukraine and, no, and Tigray, but uh, we will also refer to other conflicts what is happening there and uh, what possibilities, political and legal possibilities exist to combat these crimes and to support those affected and what contribution should Germany make? These are the questions we want to ask today. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our panel. We are pleased to have Katerina Cherepaka with us. She's director of the Ukrainian human rights organization La Strada that supports victims of domestic violence, human trafficking, and sexualized violence. A warm welcome to you, Katharina. A warm welcome also to Franziska ulm Düsterhoft. She's an Africa expert of Amnesty International Germany and there coordinates the work on the African region. A warm welcome to you, Franziska. And a very warm welcome also to Jeanette Böhme. She is responsible for politics and human rights at the women's rights organization Medica Mondiale, who, uh, among other things, campaigns for an end of sexualized war violence. Hi, Jeanette, welcome. And we're also pleased to have Alexandra Lilly Carter. She is an advisor in the field of international law and transitional justice at the Center for Justice and Accountability. Her focus is, among other things, on the strategic investigation of sexualized violence and gender-related international law crimes. A very warm welcome to all of you. Now, a few more words on the proceedings and the tech setup. First of all, I'm going to ask a few own questions to the guests, and after 50 to 60 minutes, we will open the discussion for the audience. Please um, write your chat. Uh, sorry, your question into the chat. You will find the button in the lower bar and my colleague uh, Luisa will then co um, collect your questions uh, and uh, perhaps also uh, pull them and read them out also for translation. I would like to begin with Katerina. In the war against Ukraine, uh, there are often reports about sexualized violence. In April, you reported before the UN Security Council about systematic rapes by Russian soldiers what is uh, currently happening. Can you tell us what is uh, currently going on? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Leila, uh, dear colleagues. Well, the situation is continuous, of course. Um, as you know that uh, th these types of violence, sexualized violence, is uh, this type uh, of violence that's hardly reported even during the peaceful times. And of course, we all understand that uh, these cases, there are, there are a lot of such cases, uh, specifically in our organization. We, at this moment, we have already 18 uh, cases uh, regarding 18 persons. Uh, 17 of them are women, one young man, 
um, three uh, among women, three are underage girl. And of course, it's not only the cases that are existing in Ukraine. There are um, figures and cases uh, proce processed by the General Prosecutor Office. There are uh, cases um, and uh, survivors that are assisted by partner uh, civil society organization uh, working in Ukraine and in other countries. There are cases and reports to the Ombudsman Office. There are cases and reports uh, identified and processed by the national prosecu uh, the, by the national police. But even if we let's say combine or uh, summarize all these figures, that would not be the full picture of the situation. And unfortunately, with the process of investigation, with the uh, during the um, uh, during the freeing uh, the Ukrainian territories, uh, more and more cases are revealed. At the same time, we all know that there are still a lot of uh, people, still a lot of territories and regions are remain to be under the occupation. And this uh, also, uh, this, this happening there as well. Uh, in our organization, we have the hotline and we do receive uh, calls and messages regarding, um, regarding uh, the cases of sexualized violence. So again, this is the, uh, the type of the violence that going to be uh, revealed even in the later perspective. We all understand that the consequences will be much, uh, much uh, more difficult and there are, will be more uh, women, mainly this is the women who would report, um, hopefully who would report, but more important, who would receive necessary assistance uh, and help after uh, the, the violence they survived. Und kannst du uns noch ein bisschen schildern, wie ihr die Frauen dann... Can you also describe to us how you reach out to the women? You said that you cannot reach out to many territories, but you're also sitting in the midst of the war and you yourself are also affected by that, of course. How can you, under these circumstances, provide support? Uh, within our organization, we operate uh, two national toll-free hotline. One is the national toll-free hotline for prevention, domestic violence, human trafficking, and gender discrimination. And another is the national toll-free hotline for children and youth. Uh, they, at this moment, they work both 24-7, uh, provide telephone and uh, online consulting. And we do receive uh, calls or messages from survivors or from the witnesses uh, of sexualized violence uh, who re really would like to get some assistance, including we receive the uh, cases from the occupied territories. Actually, the first case we received during the first weeks of the war was a case and was the message from a woman who was uh, raped together with her daughter and that was the case uh, from the cities that was occupied at that moment and unfortunately this city is still occupied. Um, so yes, this is one of the channels that we receive uh, and reach out with the survivors, but also there is a um, referral from the some other institutions, including state institutions like uh, General Prosecutor Office. So they may refer also uh, women and survivors uh, to our organization for helping and providing, um, assisting with getting uh, necessary services, including psychological, uh, maybe medical, other issues, or other services that are needed. Und wie ist das mit, mit and what about women who are fleeing? There are many women, of course, who have fled with their children and they go to neighboring countries or have to travel onwards. So what about services for them? Do you, for example, also coordinate with women's rights organizations in Poland or other countries? Is it at all possible? It's also very difficult, for example, in Poland to get health services once you sustained a rape, for example. How do you do that at the moment? Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, specifically a lot of women together with the children, they uh, uh, were able to escape and were able to leave the country. And of course, we're quite aware that there are uh, a number of them that experience this type of violence while staying in Ukraine, while staying in the occupied territories. And of course, the, the main uh, need for them is the security. Uh, and of course, we also understand that uh, 
very often, and that's what we see from the calls and messages we receive to the hotline, they are not ready to report about the uh, not ready to report about the crimes, but rather need an assistant. And speaking, uh, of course, uh, about the coordination and cooperation with partner organization, this is very important that we do uh, uh, ensure this exchange of the information, exchange of the available services and contacts, trying to disseminate the information here in Ukraine, but also refer to our partners in other countries. This is uh, our partners within the La Strada International Network, WAVE Network, organization, specifically women's organization, working in uh, addressing the violence against women issues. But of course, uh, it's, it's also one of the issues you've uh, indicated, this is the access to the reproductive uh, uh, rights and medical aspects of that, and specifically in some countries, specifically in Poland, which has uh, a lot of limitation for, uh, for survivors uh, of sexualized violence who uh, end up uh, being pregnant uh, under, after the, the violence they have. And of course, this is the challenge. This is the challenge that is quite, uh, quite known here and of course quite known in, uh, in Poland uh, among our partner organization. Unfortunately, there are not many choices, you know, not many opportunities for them. One of the options that is um, supported is that uh, it's uh, one of the options is to, for a woman is to return back to Ukraine to do medical, uh, all medical necessary things that she has to, you know, to, to make an abortion and then again trying to live. But of course, this is not the, the safest, uh, not the easiest and uh, not really like a um, uh, care for a uh, care uh, um, uh, way to you know to to deal with uh, survivors who experience this type of the trauma. But yes, this is very important to ensure uh, existence of the services available services uh, for uh, Ukrainian refugees who suffered from these types of the violence. At the beginning, you said that many different levels and instances follow uh, these crimes, document them and punish them. Is there a certain cooperation, any coherence in the way uh, of approaching this or can that be very different? Uh, there is a, uh, there is of course, there is a coordination, but at the same time, uh, as as I also mentioned, there is uh, not many uh, survivors who are ready to talk and who are ready, like, uh, to witness, to testify, and to give the evidence and report. And this is one of the issues uh, about uh, the. Like, uh, identification uh, and collecting and documenting these types of the crime. At the same time, it's also uh, quite difficult to ensure and the occupied territories. It's also quite difficult to ensure with the cases when, uh, for example, survivors already left the country. And of course, one of the uh, need that uh, we, we all identified, all the institutions identify, this is the necessity in strengthening the capacities of the all the specialists that are involved in process of documenting, in processes of uh, providing assistance, collecting the data, you know, working with the uh, survivors. That's, um, of course, one of the issues. So this, again, as far as it's still going on, and we are like, uh, we are also in the process. It's like um, living process, uh, developing or getting the knowledge, getting the uh, practice, um, using or applying to the existing international practice, uh, but at the same time, uh, trying to, uh, you know, to, to strengthen the uh, national capacities and to address those challenges uh, that we meet. Yeah, danke, Katharina. Well, not you. Thank you very much, Katharina. Of course, we also want to discuss what should be done at the political level also in Germany, but this is something we then can, of course, do on the panel once we have uh, also uh, taking a look at other cases. I would like to move on to Francisca now. Last year, Amnesty International published the report. I don't know whether they realize I'm a person, rape and sexual violence in the conflict in Tigray. That is a report that mainly deals with a sexualized violence in the war in Tigray. For the conflict in Northern Ethiopia and its victims, Despite the massive brutality, there is little international attention, nevertheless, and also in Germany, there's not a lot of attention for that. So what will the situation look like today? This report is from August 2021, as far as I have seen. So what's the situation today? How has that developed? Well, the situation hasn't improved, essentially. We 
daily document violations of human rights in the conflict, also in other areas of Ethiopia, but still uh, in the north around Tigray, sexualized violence is one tool of warfare in the region. Since sexualized violence is so widespread and also the scope is so huge, we assume that it is done with the knowledge of the different actors and governments involved. Sexualized violence in the region means, and we have documented rapes, mass rapes on a daily basis, very often gang rapes. So women are raped by several men. We have also documented many cases of targeted genital mutilation using objects and to a lesser degree also sexual enslaving. And this goes hand and hand with an ethnic compon component. So the women and girls affected are also ethnically uh, hu humiliated and insulted. There is no will to be felt to stop this or to take people to account. The report says that the sexualized violence against women, often very young women, that they could constitute war crimes and crimes against humanity. Could you explain why? As I said at the beginning, looking at the whole conflict in the north of Ethiopia, so it does not only affect Tigray, but also the other regions, Amhara, Afar, their sexualized uh, violence plays a role. It is used by all parties to the conflict to gain control, to break the will of the civil population by humiliation, by destruction of the communities. So the human rights violations I have just listed are war crimes, though they violate the human humanitarian international law. We found this in Tigray, mainly through Amharic uh, forces, but also Ethiopian ones. We, but we also found it in the Amhara region by Tigray military forces. So when we look at this scope, it's clear that these crimes took place and that those responsibility need to be taken to account. We also found crimes against humanity, which mean huge systematic attacks against the civil population. And in our most recent report this year, we documented human rights violations, especially in the Western Tigray region. And there we concluded that Amharic forces use sexualized violence to humiliate women and girls in a targeted way. Just to give you an example, they do it 
by telling the women and girls we will continue to do it and you also have to expect to be sexually enslaved if you do not leave the region. So here the ethnic component comes into play in Amhara. We also found some indication that there could also be a crimes committed against humanity. Amnesty International is a human rights organization. So you are not on the ground and can directly give support to the people affected. Do you know whether there is an access to organizations that can, can provide support on the ground or is it very difficult to say what the situation is when it comes to specific support. When we talk about Tigray, we are talking of a region which since 2020 faces daily human rights violations and which is completely cut off. There haven't been any telephone lines, so I can not call my relatives to find out whether they are still at life. There is no connection to financial services. There is no internet and no organizations are allowed to enter the region. So support is very difficult. In We could read quite a lot that humanitarian aid was blocked. Now this has sometimes changed, but this is still a drop in the bucket. And the problem is that it is hardly possible to coordinate uh, support on the ground without being able to communicate via telephone, etc. And the same applies to other organizations women and girls are completely left alone and they have to go on their own to camps for displaced persons so they are completely left alone and we don't see any will by the Ethiopian government to provide support even the humanitarian aid that has been approved can sometimes not be distributed because also petrol is rather limited in the region. So it's hugely difficult. Thank you, Francisca. Jeanette Medica Mongyal is very close with regard to this issue actually you founded the organization as a result of what happened. Do you think that there is today a broad public awareness that sexualized violence is systematically used as a weapon of war and how widespread is it in politics? I think the discourse of sexualized violence as a means of warfare has been going on. We did it in the context of the war in Bosnia and the genocide in Rwanda. Then the issue came to the international agenda. So the issue was condemned, but it was also instrumentalized, also the victims were instrumentalized, similar to what is happening in the Ukraine. And we established ourselves in 1993 in response to the mass rapes and also in protests about instrumentalizing the victims. We saw that Muslim Bosniak women were systematically raped. Many of them were in targeted 
rape camps and they were only released when it was too late to have an abortion and the aim was clearly to terrorize the population and to destroy the Bosniak community. At the same time in Bosnia and in other countries, we also saw that women uh, are victims in war situations. They are subjected to forced marriage, to rape. Most of the perpetrators are males, but not only military forces, but even civilians. And what is difficult is that often it cannot be proven that these violent acts were really ordered by the military, but we know from our experience that sexualized violence in conflicts is not an unavoidable byproduct, but it can be prevented if the commanders forbid this and also sanction such behavior. What is an important point is that women and girls experience a lot of gender-based violence in conflicts, but also before and after such conflicts. But the violence escalates in war situations. So we think it's very important to look at the root causes of this violence, which is based in discriminatory structures of our patriarch society and what measures can be taken to prevent it and to support people who are affected by it. Well, currently, I see in the context of the Ukraine that the focus is very much on the strategic element. And my impression is actually that the focus is not so much on the persons affected, but the focus is very much on the perpetrator, their intentions, which is important also to persecute them. But and to take those who could have prevented it to account. But we see often that the focus goes away from the survivors. They are often instrumentalized. It's put on the agenda, but when it comes to giving them long-term support, not a lot is happening. I see this in Bosnia, that almost 30 years after the beginning of war, uh, those people concerned are still stigmatized, though it was very high up in the political agenda in the Dayton peace negotiations, women didn't play a role. The issue didn't play a role in the peace agreement. So I think it's very important to have a broader focus looking at the different forms of violence and the root causes for it, which we consider very important. Thank you, Ekaterina. I will give you the opportunity to respond to that in a moment. But Jeanette, I would also like to continue to ask, namely, what instruments do we have today to combat that? Can you say something about the development of the responses that have, over the past decades, been given? I mean, a few things have indeed happened. And how effective are they? Have you in some way observed that sexualized violence conflicts has reduced? Or is it that despite the awareness having arisen, is it still the case that the situation has not changed? On the one hand, 
today there's quite a comprehensive uh, normative that is legal framework on uh, fighting sexualized war violence both at national level partly also that is rather at international level but partly also at national level among other things after the experience uh, with Bosnia and Rwanda, the Rome Statute was created and uh, sexualized war violence, as mentioned, has been recognized as a war crime, as a crime against humanity. And theoretically, it uh, can uh, also be uh, persecuted by the International Criminal Court. However, we have seen that in practice, this has hardly worked. And I think uh, Lily Carter may later on say something more on the reasons. Uh, at this uh, criminal law level. This is one thing. The next thing is that today there's been quite a comprehensive agenda for women and peace and security at UN level. In October 2000, the UN Security Council at that time um, adopted the resolution 1325, uh, Women, Peace and Security, and demanded that women and girls are protected against violence in armed conflicts, but that they also must participate in peace processes as players. So it went beyond regarding women just as victims, but also to see them in their role as players for societal change and peace and to strengthen them. And since then, the Security Council has had uh, new resolutions uh, following up to this uh, resolution, created a framework, and member states of the United Nations uh, who are conflict parties are under obligation to implement this. The problem is that at that level, there are no sanction mechanisms for the legally, um, you know, demanding that. And the reality is that at that level too, the practical implementation is totally insufficient. And I think this is due to, or let me say there are different reasons for that. On the one hand, the political will is still missing. I also believe that the awareness is missing in many respects, that this is not just a women's rights topic, but also a security relevant topic, a topic that has relevant for peace. And also when it comes to the implementation and holistic implementation of the resolution 1325, we are uh, still uh, patriarchal uh, societies and uh, back to patriarchal societies and dominating relationships between the uh, sexes. So this is actually the starting point for the agenda. It's not just about a few showcase projects to be financially supported. Uh, rather, a different understanding of security is needed to address that topic. And generally, to implement the agenda of uh, women, peace and security, um, has not the adequate financial resources it needs, uh, not even at international level. And I believe one important starting point could be to take a look at um, whether it's not possible to strengthen the anchoring of this national framework at national level through adequate legislation, for example, like in Germany uh, with the International Law Criminal Code or national action place for implementing the uh, women, peace and security agenda, which at the moment is very important. Also, it's important that worldwide, there is also a backlash regarding women's rights. So one must actively try that this normative framework that basically exists is challenged. It must be weakened and it's just, uh, um, um, uh, so this is being done and it's important to defend this framework. I think uh, new conventions and resolutions are fine, but we won't get a lot out of that. Of course, it's desirable to uh, strengthen the existing legislation, but the focus must clearly be on international and national implementation. I would like to play this back to Katerina. Would you like to say something on what Jeanette said, namely that it is often about the perpetrators and the focus goes away from the victims, namely that they are mostly left behind and no one really looks after them. Have you also got the impression that this could happen in the Ukraine or what are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I would I would relate to what uh, Jeanette, uh, Jeanette said that uh, of course um, yeah this is the pretty similar uh, situation in Ukraine. Uh, of course, one of the intentions specifically, if uh, we speak about the intention uh, of from the state uh, from the state the state institution to prosecute to identify to bring criminals to the justice. But from the what we see, as I already mentioned, there are really um, the, the survivors are not ready to talk, and uh, there is not enough. I don't know, infrastructure, services um, uh, surrounding that would be so re really supportive for them to be able to restore their, first of all, to ensure their security, to restore their resources, uh, to stabilize them, uh, I mean, to be able to recover and then maybe then take the decision to report or not to report. What, from what we also see, is that um, that is also relevant to what Jeanette said that uh, sometimes if, if it's about the survivor of the uh, sexualized violence, it's more about the survivor herself, mostly herself or himself, uh, and about the perpetrator. But from what we also see, there is like a more broader uh, context of the problems and issues that also would address the child or the children of the survivor, relatives, parents, I don't know, some, uh, you know, close surrounding. And this is like a complex and uh, complex of the challenges, complex of the impact, because in fact, it is not, um, of course, if it was the case of sexual violence against a person, so the survivors, survivors in the center, but uh, all those who might witness, and very often in the cases that we see, it was done uh, in front of the either children or parents or other family members, or I mean, just people from the next uh, building or, or people who were staying in the, in, the, in the place, in the shelter where it could happen. I mean, this is like a really broader context. And uh, from what we understand, this aspect is really not uh, really addressed at that moment, and this is something that should be identified first and ensured uh, uh, addressed properly, and this is something that should be developed and what we also should develop uh, both like a civil society, a state institution, to have the broader picture, to get the broader picture, to have the broader understanding of all the impact, all the negative consequences that it has on the survivor, on her family, on the like uh, community uh, they are living and they are going to I mean they continue living and you know on the society in general so yeah thank you dann würde ich gern zu dir übergehen alexandra okay, i would like to move on to you alexandra several legal instruments have already been mentioned and overall the criminal uh, prosecution has been neglected for quite a while as far as the uh, gender-based aspects are concerned. How is sexualized violence uh, anchored in international criminal law today, uh, today and what uh, possibilities to prosecute are there today? Thank you so much for your question. And also thank you to the organizing team and all participants to really look at this from a comparative perspective, which I think is so, so important if we really want to advance effective accountability strategies. So to root us a little bit in the law, I think it's important to notice that the umbrella term sexual violence actually encompasses several offenses that are outlawed under international criminal law. And it includes rape, but notably, um, and this is often forgotten, it includes other acts of a sexual nature that harm the sexual integrity, the sexual autonomy, and the reproductive autonomy of a person. And these may include enforced prostitution, for example, but also forced pregnancy and forced sterilization or under crimes against humanity, any other form of sexual viol violence of comparable gravity of other acts of crimes against humanity. These may include acts such as forced nudity, for example. I think if we look at The Hague, there's an organization called the Women's Initiative for Gender Justice, and they did great work in compiling the hate principles on sexual violence. And this is a document that provides guidance to practitioners, but also activists, um, where survivors and civil society organizations had their say in it as to what are the various forms of sexual violence and crimes that actually fall under the term sexual violence, and that may be useful in ongoing conversations about this. 
Um, we also have legally the situation that evidence of sexual violence can serve as an indication that certain other international crimes are being committed. For example, evidence of sexual violence and acts of a sexual nature can be an indicia or evidence for the crime of slavery, for example. Now, in terms of options of prosecution and investigation, international criminal law, as Bajanet was already pointed out, allows um, for sexual violence and in various forms to be investigated and prosecuted as a war crime, crime against humanity, and as genocide. The ad hoc tribunals for Rwanda and Bosnia, as we already heard, really did some amazing preparatory work in that regard. And we now find all of these three crimes codified um, at the International Criminal Court and the respective Rome statute. So we have law and we have the jurisprudence that support for sexual violence to be investigated and prosecuted during a genocide, during a widespread and systematic attack against the civilian population, which is the context we need to bring forward a case for crimes against humanity. But we also um, have it with respect to war crimes, so in the context of an armed conflict, either international armed conflict or national armed conflict, non-international armed conflict. However, as, as we also have heard from various speakers today, the law and the jurisprudence does not do the trick by itself. And to bring a case forward, to bring really accountability for sexual violence in conflict settings, in mass violence settings forward, we need the evidence. And the evidence is often failing. And I would like to name some of the reasons for this. I think sexual violence due to the structural reasons that exist um, are still not being prioritized by investigators and prosecutors working on these cases. There is still the misconception that this is a crime that happens in the context of a war or mass violence situation. We have the situation that patriarchal violence against women, against children, against queer bodies is still normalized, even if we don't have a war, if we don't have another situation of the mass violence. So if we don't manage to address this violence, how we manage to address it during the wartime. We also need resources to better the specifically train international criminal investigator with sensitive approaches when it comes to gender, but also religion, race, ethnicity, and other intersecting grounds. We need, and this is something Katerina just mentioned, we really need effective and meaningful cooperation with organizations and structures that support survivors when it comes to their physical, mental, um, but also economic um, and social well-being and security. Without these conditions, how do we expect anyone to speak about attacks to their sexual integrity, autonomy, or reproductive autonomy. Um, and here I would like us to critically reflect on possible limitations and risks that go hand in hand with referring to sexual violence as a weapon of war. First, legally, it really contradicts that we need the existence of an armed conflict as a prerequisite to prosecute it as an international crime. And that's simply not true because crimes against humanity do not legally require the presence of an armed conflict to take place. It requires the widespread and systematic attack against the civilian population. And here it's really important to note that it's what we actually want to say with sexual violence as a weapon of war is that there is a political dimension to this crime in a given situation of mass violence or armed conflict. Um, secondly, um, and this has already been pointed out, if we use sexual violence as a weapon of war, it directs our attention to the perpetrator and it takes it away from the array of physical, psychological, economic, and social harms as experienced by affected persons and as Katerina mentioned, by their communities, right? We saw in Germany, Bosnia, Rwanda, the array of intergenerational trauma that comes with conflict-related sexual violence. And this is something that we cannot see if we look at sexual violence as a weapon of war exclusively. I would also like to point to the work of Regina Mühlhäuser in that, uh, in that regard. And she really says that sexual violence as a weapon of war, if we use the, that term, it may simplify the structural root causes that are, that are quite complex for why sexual violence is occurring and it is being carried out and not sanctioned by state armies. Um, 
and and we really need to look at this more specifically right we need to look at gender as the driving structural root cause for sexual violence and patriarchy as the the root cause as to why within an army still power being exercised over bodies is being tolerated is being accepted and is not being sanctioned right and lastly, and this is a point to add from my side, if we speak about sexual violence as a weapon of war, it may le legitimize to meet sexual violence with weapons rather than with working with historical and present root causes as to why bodies of women, bodies of children in the, in the Ukraine, even babies, but also LGBTIQ persons um, are attacked by state and also non-state armed actors in situations of conflict and, and mass violence. And, and here I would really like to close with something that, that was already being said as well, but really to look at and understand the specific psychological, physical, economic, and social impact of such crimes. Um, we need to come up with intersectorial and sustainable responses. And that includes responses through the criminal justice system, but it cannot be limited to such, right? So we need prior work to be done even for criminal justice attempts to be able to advance. And this relates to um, the, the women, peace and security agenda. So if we are serious about feminist foreign policy or feminist policy making in general, we need to send to survivors, their communities, we need to send healing and ending structural violence um, that have patriarchal root causes. Ja, vielen Dank, dass du auch nochmal den Titel der Veranstaltung... Uh, uh, Thank you for also challenging the title of this event and provided some more context. You as a non-lawyer, I think that criminal prosecution leads to many investigations. You need to document everything. You have to interrogate witnesses. Katarina already mentioned how difficult it is for the survivors to talk about it. And this is re-traumatizing, especially when it is to a non- psychologist, but somebody who just gathers evidence, you said it requires a very sensible, sensitive approach, but it is very important to get the evidence. What can organizations do who have experience, who have that have contacts that already work with the people affected? Uh, well, and it's so difficult in cases of sexualized uh, violence, or are there more uh, methods now available? Yeah, so maybe to the first part of your question, I think um, organizations that are supporting or in contact with survivors of sexual violence in a variety of setting, I think as a prior point of departure, it's so important to establish referral networks, right? If you don't have a psychologist or medical doctor or asylum lawyer or any other professional you need to provide holistic support to survivors of sexual violence, then as an organization, I would, I would, as a first point of action, to really establish such a referral um, network so that survivors have the support they need to feel secure um, to, to come forward to speak about what has happened to them. This is, of co course, also a call to those funding such potential structures that we need long lasting um, structures for survivors of sexual violence and conflict. Um, but that also those organizations that have been working with uh, domestic violence, violence against women, or also violence against men that have patriarchal root causes, right? These organizations, they need to be supported wherever they are on a long-term basis to, to provide such support. In terms of legally advancing those cases, um, so we already spoke about the International Criminal Court, but also some of the shortcomings um, in that regard that we have seen a very, very slow progression of cases um, that really speak about the whole array of sexual violence um, that is outlawed under international criminal law. And this has a variety of 
variety of reasons that I already spoke about, but I would also like to speak about um, the existing diversification of avenues that can lead us to accountability for sexual violence um, in conflict or mass atrocity situation. So on the one hand, in Germany, we saw that the, that the principle of universal jurisdiction um, in relation to Syria, um, when it comes to uh, crimes, including sexual violence being committed in government run detention facilities, has been um, now found to be have been committed as part of a widespread and systematic attack against the civilian populations as a crime against humanity. And we also saw in relation to the crimes committed against the Yazidi by the non-state armed actor Daesh or ISIS, um, that rape and other forms of sexual violence that have been committed in the context of the enslavement of Yazidi women and girls and children. Um, have been brought to account in a German court. And this is possible through legal principle that's called universal jurisdiction that allows for the investigation and prosecution of international crimes, so genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes that have no link to Germany. That means they have not been committed in Germany, not by or against a German national. However, and here I also see a risk um, when it comes to Ukraine and possibly Ethiopia, we saw the photos of Yazidi uh, women and children um, being taken away, being enslaved. We heard the news and so, saw social media images and videos um, of sexual crimes being committed against them very, very early on. However, it took years and years and years after 2014 for, for this information to land in a court of law and being really dealt with there. And here I would like to speak about the discrepancy between media coverage and that evidence actually landing with an investigator and prosecutor. Now there again are many reasons for this um, and, and they do not lay with the survivor being comfortable enough to come forward only, right? So they, they are really laying with the fact that structures did not exist for survivors to come forward in a, in a way that made them feel safe. And maybe another kind of myth I would like to address here is that legally, it would be great to have evidence that someone ordered sexual violence to go forward in terms of having a quote unquote successful case, but an international criminal law and its domestic form in Germany, we don't need that. But we need information about that there was someone in charge who knew about sexual violence happening, but this person did neither prevent nor stop nor sanction this violence in any way. And this information um, we can definitely get and, and in relation to Ukraine um, that has been there for a long time, even to uh, before the inv Russian invasion of Ukraine, for example. Um, and lastly, in terms of universal jurisdiction, um, investigations and prosecutions going forward, I would like to highlight here the central role of civil society actors, activists, that really, um, I would say, pushed and encouraged the German Federal Prosecutor's Office and the investigators at the Federal Police to really prioritize the investigation of sexual and gender-based crimes in both these structural investigations underway. And we can really hope only that for Ukraine, this um, kind of expertise and experience that was being gathered by these authorities in relation to Syria and Iraq can be harnessed um, for structure investigations in Ukraine that are already ongoing. And there's not just Germany that's looking into this. So there are at least nine others, if not more European states that have open structure investigation in relation to Ukraine. We have the ICC that's being highly cooperative with um, Europol and such states. And we have an established uh, United Nations Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine that is also supporting such efforts. Ja, vielen Dank, um, Alexandra. Ich würde noch mal bei Franziska und Katharina. Thank you, Alexandra. I would like to ask Franziska and Katharina, what would be your recommendations? What can Germany do or what can be done internationally with regard to Tigray, Ethiopia and Ukraine? Do you have specific demands to make? Who is to start? Francisca, you. Okay. 
Well, looking at Tigray, the situation is quite different from Ukraine, especially at the moment the focus is on Ukraine and every day in Germany we see images of crimes against humanity, though the attention by the media is at the height. Well, this is not the case when it comes to tea crisis. So our first demand or our first expectation is it takes attention. Attention was there at the beginning of the conflict, but then when the focus shifted to the Ukraine, this attention declined. We are talking about conflict that started in November 2020, entailing huge crimes against human rights. We, we see many videos of massacres and other violations of uh, rights. And this conflict has not yet made it to the uh, agenda of the United Nations or the African Union. So uh, it is really not in the focus of the international community. What we need here is more attention, more commitment also by the German government. The German government is a close partner to the Ethiopian government. We need political pressure because the lack of interest was used by the Ethiopian government to increase repressions and to imprison journalists, human rights activists. So we also need opinions, expertise by uh, those responsible for human rights in the German government, or also expertise by the German embassy on the ground. Other embassies are much more active. We do not see it currently when we look at the German government. Well, uh, we have to put an end to people going with impunity. So these soldiers, they uh, make videos while violating women and they make it public. So they do uh, not expect any consequences. And as long as this is the case, things will go on. Uh, talking at the national dialogue that aims at establishing peace this can it can only be successful if impunity is also part of this dialogue and one more point i already mentioned humanitarian relief here the german government can do a lot but here again it takes political pressure to give access to this humanitarian uh, relief that the uh, sanctions with regard to petrol are taken uh, are banned. There is also no support for medical centers and actually the medical infrastructure has completely collapsed in the region. Let me just give you an example, which is a lighthouse uh, project. Jeanette had already addressed it in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Linus Mukwege, who also got the uh, Nobel Prize for Peace and operates treatment centers there. 
and uh, hospitals for women and uh, victims of sexualized violence. Uh, that is uh, massively funded also by the German government, among other things. So this is also something needed in Ethiopia, but not just uh, focused on one uh, well-known person, but on a, a much more broad-based uh, scale, also for smaller NGOs. Katerina, can you perhaps also briefly add something to that? Because we also want to have for some time for discussion. There are already a few questions. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, well, I would like to say that, uh, of course, there is a kind of the waves of attention uh, to any war, any crisis uh, in any country. And of course, after some time, the intention, especially attention in the media would decrease. And to be uh, to, to remind ourselves that, in fact, the war has started in Ukraine back to 2014. So it's already eight years of the war. And of of course, during all that time, uh, not, not to forget it, I mean, it's not just started uh, only in this year. And of course, during all those years, the attention uh, and covering of what is going on in, uh, in Ukraine was like um, decreasing since that time. Even uh, back to 2014-15, we received the cases of uh, sexual violence, sexualized violence committed uh, on the East. Uh, by the occupants. So, I mean, at, at, and at this year it just became the really full scale and covered for the whole country. Uh, from uh, the recommendations and from what would be really needed, uh, well, this is actually the, of course, it would be the, the needs in support for the support for, uh, for Ukraine, for, for support for. Uh, support to protect, to save the lives because um, they, they just um, keep killing us. Uh, apart from raping uh, our citizens with just physical um, physical killing, uh, as for um, developing the uh, developing the services, the infrastructures uh, for assisting the survivors of sexualized violence, I think that is very important to support. And the colleague previously, uh, Francesca uh, Francesca previously mentioned support of the organizations, especially specialized organizations and services, not only in Ukraine but of course in Ukraine as well, but in other countries who are receiving our refugees, who are re receiving our, uh, our citizens who escaped from the war and ensuring that they might have the access to all necessary services, including the abortion if needed or when needed, including all other types of reproductive and not only reproductive, reproductive but psychological uh, assistance and uh, assistance that might be like uh, really covered uh, all the complex uh, needs of the survivors. Uh, so that that is something that's uh, really needed and would be really supported. And of course, the expertise, the expertise of the uh, of the specialists who already has that uh, in the other countries, who already have the expertise, the knowledge, and the approaches of the programs. Uh, it's also important to understand that. This this is a kind of long-term, uh, long-term um, situation, and require strategical and uh, long-term uh, approaches uh, to any programs. Uh, coordination is also a very important thing because there are various initiatives, and it's very important to have at least combine or uh, you know complement each other rather than creating some kind of distressing. But coordination, exchange of the information, uh, that's that's very. Um, important also in the perspective of supporting various uh, initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Katharina. Then would I ask you, Luisa. Thank you, Katharina. Luisa, I would like to ask you now to start with giving us the questions. Yes, thank you very much for the interesting inputs. We have got a few questions already, but please uh, um, file some more via the Q&A feature. At the beginning, a lot was said about the motives of sexualized violence. And one question is how these components, critical um, research in males and uh, sexualized uh, war violence, how can that be brought together or thought together? And another question is whether sexualized violence can be understood as a special form of torture. Jeanette, would you perhaps want to say something on that? But of course, also others. On the subject, what was the term critical um, uh, manhood and sexualized war? Yes, at the beginning, we also said we need to place and enhance the focus 
uh, on sexualized uh, violence in wars and the patriarchal uh, structures and discriminating uh, gender situation must be focused on in armed conflict to be able to develop strategies in order to prevent this uh, violence, but also as a follow up and uh, toxic uh, manliness, as it's also called. This is also part of that. That is what stereotypes, what alleged societal properties are assigned to men and women, and how do they then position themselves and act in the societal context? I think this is just an important topic we have to deal with, where, however, I also believe that there is a lot of upside and a lot of uh, things to be done when it comes not just to the scientific and purely theoretical analysis, but when it comes to also setting up concrete projects with view to that and implementing them in practice. So my impression is that there is still a lot of bias to act. And the second question on sexualized violence and torture, is that about an assessment from a legal perspective? This was not part of the question, but I could imagine that this, is, uh, that this also has a legal uh, aspect. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, of course, uh, sexualized violence, I would say no matter whether in a war context or non-war context, usually has destructive consequences uh, for the survivors, no matter whether it's women, girls, or other persons. And this not just at an individual level, but often also at family level and uh, societal level. And I would like to follow up to one point touched upon a while ago, namely by my co-panelists, namely the subject of long-term support. It really acquires a buildup of long-term and holistic support and protective structures in the context of armed conflicts, especially also in post-war contexts, such that the necessary support survivors need, and not just survivors, but also family, can be maintained in the long run. For example, we carried out a study in 1998 on the long-term consequences in Bosnia-Herzegovina, where 70% of the people surveyed said 25 years later that uh, the rape uh, still affected their lives uh, to a great extent. And one reason for that is, on the one hand, because it's often not sufficient, uh, not, there are not sufficient support structures, but also the society does not respond to this issue. The stigmatization is on the survivors and the, the blame, but there is no comprehensive societal appraisal, reappraisal of that injustice. A lot was talked about criminal prosecution. This is, of course, one instrument. But in addition to that, at a societal level, measures are needed to reappraise this injustice and uh, examine that. And um, only this way can the traumatic experiences uh, be uh, processed and also transgenerational traumatization can be prevented this way. Thank you, Jeanette. Alexandra, could you perhaps say something more on sexualized violence can be seen as a special form of torture? From a legal perspective, perhaps also, could it be dealt like that before a court? Yes, so to, to that specific question, yes, um, sexual violence can be understood or and also legally characterized, investigated and prosecuted as a form of torture if it has occurred um, uh, in, in the context of torture, of course. Um, here I would like to say that in international criminal law, it's also possible to then um, kind of investigate and prosecute the conduct as two crimes. So for example, sexual violence that has occurred during an interrogation in which a person had a specific intention to get certain information out of a person. Um, that and in that context, sexual violence has occurred that can be understood as torture. But also if we look at a detention facility in which torture happens, there's a lot of sexual violence that happen outside of the quote unquote interrogation setting, right? We saw this in Syria, we see this in many other places in which detention occurs. Um, so I would like to note here that often investigators and prosecutors go for the more 
known and quote unquote easily prosecutable crimes such as murder or such as torture and then other crimes that may seem or may be perceived as more complex such as sexual violence um, fall down the agenda and fall down of really being prioritized when witnesses are being questioned and other evidence is being sought. So here would always advocate for not only incorporating it into torture and understanding it as sexualized torture, but also really investigating it as sexual violence. Because if sexual violence happens during torture or during an interrogation session, it hardly just happens there. So to look at the detention center um, more broadly from that. Thank you, Alexandra. Luisa. Weiter. Thank you, Alexandra. Luisa, any further questions? Yes, right. It was uh, said that we have talked a lot about sexualized violence against women and girls. The a question was to what extent is sexualized violence also practiced against men? Is there anyone who wants to respond to that from you, from the panel? If not, Francisca, yeah, please go ahead. Well, yes, uh, this is the case. So sexualized violence against boys especially uh, has, uh, and, and also men, has happened in the context of Tigray. The situation is, however, that the, the very, very large majority is against women and girls. And men and boys or adolescents, male adolescents, in fact, tend to be more likely to be victims of massacres in this context. That is, they're really killed. If, if it's okay, I could also add uh, on the Ukrainian context. Uh, well, the same. I mean, the majority, of course, this is the uh, the women and the girls. Uh, and speaking about men, of course, there's also an issue. Uh, but uh, from what we see, uh, I mean, if to look at the close cases that we have in our organization, it's only one case about the male uh, person, but uh, we all know that again, back to 2014, 15 and years further. So when there was an investigation uh, and interviewing of the, um, those uh, uh, people, men and, and uh, men and women who were kept uh, in Lugansk and Donetsk uh, regions in the, uh, you know, and were uh, tortured. Um, that was really the case when men did not uh, were not ready uh, to uh, to inform uh, or to report about the, any types of sexualized violence against them, and it's it it was it was relevant to to women as well, but uh, for men it's even more complicated to identify because they really a career report uh, due various reason you know stereotypes the gender roles imposed uh, and and this but yes this is uh, the issue but. Still, the majority, vast, vast majority, this is the uh, women and girls. Es gibt ja auch durchaus Konflikte wie in um, Kambodscha zum Beispiel, wo Männer wirklich. There are still conflicts like in Cambodia, where men are systematically um, victims of sexualized violence, or they were targeted systematically. But yes, today the focus uh, is on women also because of the regions we are addressing in particular today, which again shows that this is really an instrument of power often, and that it's not about soldiers uh, uh, attacking the women because they have a lack uh, of women, so to say, but that this is really systematically applied uh, to denigrate uh, people and uh, is also targeting uh, women. Luisa, can you please continue with the questions? Yes, sure. I was also asked, uh, for example, now there's an English question, I need to switch um, my channel. Do you have any information about sexual violence against LGBTIQ? Are there any people who who know how to address these groups specifically? And then also adding to the question, especially trans women were under difficult conditions fleeing from Ukraine. Um, in, uh, among the, those cases that we have in our organization, we do not have uh, reports from the LGBTQ peop, uh, people, but uh, of course, I mean, we, we are completely aware that uh, these cases also exist. We, there are organizations uh, also in Ukraine that are providing assistance uh, specifically or who are professionalized and specialized in providing assistance and work with LGBTQ pe uh, people. For example, the Insight organization, they have the, the chatbot 
for psychological support and uh, and also for uh, for people uh, from uh, that group. Um, um, I, I think that uh, there are there are cases, but they are not revealed. Um, and again, uh, that's the statistics that are indicated, or let's say more or less official stated that it's of course not covering the whole uh, the whole situation. I do believe that um, many of those who may where man, who managed to escape Ukraine, they might ask uh, for assistance or apply for assistance while staying already in a more safer place in other countries. Yeah. Könnte vielleicht ergänzen? Ähm, genau, also wenn man... Äh Bitte. The report of the UN Director General in 2020 about sexualized uh, violence in conflicts tried to quantify some figures and there again more than 90% of the persons affected are girls, but there are also boys and LGBTQ uh, persons, but they are underrepresented. But you know, for boys, there is even a taboo in the taboo. It's difficult enough for women and girls to speak about it. And in order to create the conditions that they can talk about it, I mean, that they have a secure setting. And as I see it because of masculinity constructions and the expectations of men make it even difficult for more difficult for men's and boys and there are fewer support structures and they must also be afraid of a very strong stigmatization and LTBGI for them it's often not safe to report it not only because of stigmatization but in case of doubt, they may uh, run further risks when they report about these cases due to their identity and there are not enough support structures. Documentation and reporting, we see this problem everywhere. Often we only have qualitative estimates or estimates and the reasons are different. There are hardly any uh, quantifiable, verifiable numbers because it's very difficult in a concrete conflict to collect quantitative figures. Often it's just individual cases that are used to create a certain pattern. And often there is a lack of a setting for the persons affected to come out because they are afraid of social stigmatization of more violence. So we only have qualitative estimates, but we do not have really uh, comprehensive quantitative figures. Luisa, could you go on, please? We have a definition question. What is the definition of sexualized violation and sexualized violation as a weapon in war? And the question is also, how can pressure be exercised to improve the uh, a situation of women with regard to their reproductive rights. Alexandra, could you perhaps answer the first question? And Jeanette also mentioned the continuum between sexual violence and sexual violence in a wartime. So how would you answer this question? 
Um, good question. Thank you. I think I would like to root us back to some of the um, reflections that I had during the prior discussion. And there it's really that the term sexual violence as a weapon of war or rape as a weapon of war is not a, such a legal term, right? It's a political term that has been employed by some to really demonstrate that it's not about the individual soldier or perpetrator perpetrating rape or other forms of sexual violence against an individual because the circumstances allow it so, right? There are political and structural reasons for it. And here I would like to connect to some of the, the previous questions. I think we need to look at the fact and reality that patriarchy is harmful to all persons, right? Patriarchy is especially harmful um, if exercised through violence against all persons. Um, and therefore it needs to be combated. And we need to understand that also the, the targeting of women has a certain agenda and long lasting impact and short impact, of course, the targeting of children and babies, the targeting of LGBTIQ persons and men, but that's why a gender analysis of a conflict of a mass violent situation is so helpful because it's a prerequisite to understand what violence, sexual violence with patriarchal root causes does in a given situation against a certain person or community at a given time. If we don't have this analytical understanding that's very context specific, that plays into you know, historical and present structural realities of people, of women, children, LGBTIQ persons, men, that may already face certain discrimination, not only on, on, on their gender or age, um, but also by the way they look or their economic background, their social background, right? So we need an intersectional gender analysis to really understand why harm is being perpetrated, why sexual crimes are being perpetrated and what impact they have long-term. And I just think um, sexual violence or rape as a weapon of war is therefore not helpful because it doesn't ask for all of these things and all of these questions to be put forward. Möchte jemand anderes von euch auch noch etwas hinzufügen? Do you, you want to add something? Not really to add, but I can just subscribe to it that this is currently the crux of reports in the media. And this is why we talk about a continuum of violence and to address these root causes. Francisca, you look as if you wanted to add something or, or contradict. No, I don't want to contradict. I share this analysis, sexualized violence in the context of Tigray means, or when you see it, as one mean of warfare, it means it is being used to get benefits and controls in a conflict. And when you look at the Tigray context, you do this by breaking the will of the population and sexualized violence is one means, but not the only one. Also looting, uh, torture, uh, mistreatment can be a means, but it is used in a targeted way to make gains in a conflict and to exercise territorial control over the civil society. And an important aspect is also, it is exercised by state actors, security forces, and it is so widespread by security forces that we have to assume that it is legitimized by the government. Louisa, there is one question about feminist development and foreign policy. I would like to put it in the context. It says that 
specific demands to the German government with regard to a feminist foreign policy. I mean, many of you have probably uh, heard what Lena Baerbock said to Merz. They said, well, you can do your feminist uh, policy uh, but the 100 billion go to the Bundeswehr. And uh, Anna Lena Baerbock said, well, this is not about it. I, uh, uh, it's important to see all the victims of war. She, she spoke about uh, a visit to Srebrenica where people told her that they still suffer the consequences and this was discussed a lot in the social media. So this may be a question to all of you. The uh, question here in the chat is, what are the concrete demands to deliver on what has been said? You have already said something about it, but perhaps you could give it some more specific thoughts and uh, think loud. Of course, we of course welcome uh, what uh, Baerbock has said about a feminist foreign policy, but we would like to know what she understands by it. It has not yet been spelled out. The Foreign Office is just working on a strategy paper, and the question is, uh, and how much is it different from the agenda about women, peace and security? Because the uh, action plan uh, was just launched last year. Feminist foreign policy is more than this agenda because not all the important issues like reproductive, uh, health and rights are covered. And also the question of power plays an important role. And the question is, how does the Foreign Office define this? Also, for instance, how can we shape a feminist foreign policy? And what impact should it have abroad to help to get more gender equality? And how can we put our own foreign policy actions to the test? And the practical question, how will this be structurally anchored? How can it be mainstreamed so that a coherent feminist foreign policy is implemented? Here, it's important to ensure coherence. So uh, foreign policy also requires domestic feminist policy. And here, I see quite a gap between what is said and what it has been done so far in domestic policies. So much more is done at the foreign policy level when it comes to reproductive health and compared to paragraph 218 or the issue of flight and asylum. So foreign policy and domestic policy do not really go together and independent how the foreign minister will define it and what our ideas in the civil society is. And we will issue soon a policy paper with our ideas, but I think it can only function if foreign and domestic poli policies are coherent. If the you do not want to add something, I, I would like to uh, take up one more question. Or do you want to add something? Alexandra? Yeah, I think for me, feminist foreign policy also entails an inherently anti-racist and anti-colonial approach to the way decisions are being made and projects are being implemented and evaluated. It demands, as Jeanette said, an, a power analysis and also really brings persons 
into the conversation um, and really looks a question how what power do I hold, how do I share it? I think it's very clear that Baerbock has a great vision and I think we should internationally and domestically support it in as much as we can, but we also know the political realities around her look as such that she may not do or be able to do the entirety of what she wants right now, right? Feminist foreign policy or feminist um, policy in general for me also means to, to look at um, how traditional forms of decision-making um, may be harmful and may be fear-based. So if we look at the, the Ukraine invasion, um, what we saw in terms of this amount of money going to the military, it's a fear-based decision that is not looking into protection of people currently invaded in Ukraine, right? And how can we create a really intersectional mindful analysis of what needs to be done going forward? So I think there are things to do for people in Germany really mobilizing domestic politics, making sure it's rooted there, but also internationally really really critiquing um, decision making that is harmful and is really not informed by people it's meant to be serving. Unfortunately, time is running out. I would like to ask Katarina and uh, uh, Francisca to add something if they want, uh, or perhaps you just want to add something else. Actually, I can only subscribe to what Alexandra just said, that this as to feminist foreign policy, it's a more comprehensive approach that considers also the principles of participation. How do I handle and treat the people with whom I discuss? What are the targets and uh, an anti-racist approach taking into consideration existing expertise? And honestly, I haven't seen this in German foreign policy so far. Well, there are now attempts to do it in development cooperation, but I do not yet see it in a sustainable way. And it can not only mean to invite the civil society when you start a new Africa strategy and you get some experts and then you write this strategy and this is the end to feminist development policy, but it needs to become a coherent approach across all the different levels. So I think this is all I want to say. Thank you, Francisca. Katarina. Um, well, maybe I would just uh, to to, add, to to comment on one. Um, I would I would say that uh, apart from uh, the, the, the what colleagues previously said, um, Ukraine still needs military support. Otherwise, if we do not um, receive it again, it would be there are going to be no people, uh, no civil society who would need to be, um, you know, protected or or uh, strengthened uh, or promoted. So, unfortunately, this is the reality. So that's that's what just my comment. Well, in concluding, one could say the uh, Ukraine does not only need military support, but also a lot of support in other areas. Unfortunately, also in Germany, apart from military support, there are many spline spots. We still have a lot of questions in the chat also about Syria and more specifically about the situation in Tigray. Unfortunately, we cannot answer all of these questions. And actually, this is an issue that requires really in-depth discussion and we cannot do justice to it in one and a half hours. Nevertheless, you have outlined many important issues. And I think that the Ukraine, Ukraine 
and Tigray, it was not a direct comparison, but both it, we have, I think we have just managed to outline the points what sexualized violence is all about. Let me thank all of you and wish you the very best for your work, be it on the ground or more at a political level in cooperation with the persons affected. A big thank you to you and I hope we will stay in contact and have other such discussions to go more into depth. So I wish you all the best and also all the best to the audience.